How's that? Is that working now? That's good. Just nod? Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to try to move through this fairly quickly because this is a story of a seven and a half month round the world birding trip that my wife and I took. And there are just so many stories to tell from this. I'm sure I could go on all night, but we don't have that kind of time. But I would like to hit the highlights. I'd like to give you the feel of this. I refer to this as our journey of a thousand lifers. And it truly was that. It was a, a trip of a thousand plus new species for ourselves. And as you see here in the uh, uh, opening page of the collage, it shows you a little sample of some of the incredible variety of colorful birds that we sighted during that time. Our trip took place between September 7th and April 23rd, and is about five and a half years ago, so uh, just shy of eight months travel. Uh, we started out from Chicago, flew to London for a stopover, and then to Johannesburg. We then traveled to Madagascar for a trip into the uh, east and the south, returned back to Johannesburg after almost two weeks in Madagascar, and then did a nine-week trip all around Southern Africa in six countries. From here, we flew over to India, and uh, we had several sites there along the Indian Ocean coast, Southern India, and a number of side trips uh, in all directions out of Delhi. So six weeks time in uh, India itself, from there, we went to Nepal and then down to Thailand, traveled down the peninsula and also up to the northern part of the country. We traveled across Cambodia, stopping uh, there along the way, and then into Vietnam from Ho Chi Minh City and all the way up to Hanoi with a couple of weeks in Vietnam of birding. We then flew from Hanoi to Kuala Lumpur. We toured the yeah, peninsular portion of Malaysia and for the last part of our trip, we flew to Borneo and toured that part of the uh, island and eventually uh, returning back to Kuala Lumpur and uh, from there flying to Sing Singapore, Hong Kong and back home again. So that was our route for that whole long period of time. During our travels, we were gone for 233 days. We saw 1,328 species of birds and of that, 1,025 were entirely new to us. We also identified 124 species of mammals and we took 35,000 pictures, but fortunately for you, I left a few out tonight. <laughs> we uh, had 23 separate flights. So we uh, covered some 37,000 miles. I also drove car in nine different countries, almost 12,000 miles, variety of buses and drivers and Jeeps and other ways of getting around. Our train travel was in India. We covered over 1,500 miles there. During the trip, we also had a dozen different kinds of boats, anything from a dugout canoe to an ocean cruise. And other modes of travel included a zebu cart, I'll explain that in just a bit, an elephant ride, bicycles, scooters, motorbikes, bicycle rickshaws, motorcycle rickshaws, and tuk-tuks. <laughs> All together, we spent 104 nights in hotels, lodges, and B&Bs and also camped for 20 nights. Wow. When we arrived in Johannesburg, we were very lucky that uh, Nelson Mandela was right there to greet us. So it was very kind of him to show up. We had a couple of days in uh, Johannesburg just to, first of all, get over the jet lag and get our feet on the ground and also to wait for our flight to Madagascar, which only went a few times a week. We flew then from Johannesburg to the capital Antananarivo. From there, we uh, got a car and driver, and we headed about three hours to the east to a nice forest track and national park in the very moist forest part of the country. We spent uh, nearly a week at Andesibe Mantadia National Park. We hiked every morning on the trails around the headquarters and in the forest section there. We had found a local guide who showed us a lot of great birds, and we also had a very early morning ride up into a very large remnant forest area in the highlands where we found different species of birds that we uh, were not able to encounter in the lower elevations. So this was a very profitable trip. And of course, Madagascar, like a lot of these large island nations are known for their endemics. And we found 77 species altogether on this trip of Madagascar's endemic birds. Of course, they're also known for endemics among a whole group of uh, plants and animals, including their lemurs. And here we encountered brown lemur, the 
golden diademid shafaka. Here's an adult with young. And also a very interesting one called the Indri that had just this loud wailing, almost sounded like a humpback whale from a distance. <laughs> Among the birds, we uh, saw the Madagascar drongo. And uh, another interesting one, this is Chabert's vanga. And the whole family of vangas are very unique to uh, Madagascar. We were lucky. I ended up being a millionaire there. Uh, <laughs> they did not take charge card. And so we had to hit the ATM several days in a row. In fact, we could only take out 400,000 at a time. So I, you didn't even know after a few days where to stash all that money. It took us about two and a half million to pay off our hotel and uh, restaurant bills and as well as the guide. So it was nice to have that kind of money on you, but it doesn't get you very far. We then drove back from there to Antananarivo and waited for a flight to take us from the capital all the way to the far southwest coast. We landed here in a little town called Tulier. And uh, we stopped at a lodge. There was a local transport available, but we got our own driver. The driver took us uh, several hours up the coast and they found a very nice uh, a resort and lodge for us, a hotel right on the beach. And we we're able to make arrangements with local guides. Now, this part of the country is known as the spiny forest. It is very much dominated by cactus-like plants, and the vast majority of those are endemic to the country, as is much of its wildlife. The real outstanding trees are what you see here is the baobab. There are eight species of baobab trees in the world. One is found in Africa, one in Australia, and the other six are in Madagascar. So these are the uh, one of the several species of very unusual baobabs, or some people call them the upside down tree because it looks like the roots are up in the air. We were really lucky because we had these fellows as our guides and they really were outstanding. They have such unique local talent that they rely on, a very traditional talent, that all of the major birding companies of the world have latched onto these guys to lead the tours. We also were lucky, we were there just before the rainy season started. So actually it was before the breeding season when the birds are obviously a little bit more vocal and visible and more active. But once the breeding season started, these guys were totally booked for the next 12 weeks by all the major tour companies that come to Madagascar. Mm. This fellow's name is Musa, he started this. Using his uh, natural or native talent, uh, the birding companies picked him up to find these very hard to find birds. And since that time, he's employed his brother and also his nephew. And as I said, we had all three of them working for us. What their unique talent is, is that they will actually find the birds by tracking them in the sand. And they can tell you every bird species by its footprints and the way it walks. And I actually was skeptical. I tested them and I was astounded by their skills. So they had us walk out into the forest, had us stand in a bit of a clearing, and they would run around looking for the birds for us and come back and wave us to find something unusual, including this one. This is long-tailed roller. This is a ground roller. This is a bird that is primarily active at night and roosts under these dense bushes during the days. So the, the bird we never would have found on our own. Others included the sub-desert messite, hook-billed vanga, mm. and a bird I really wanted to see. This is sickle-billed vanga here extracting a large insect, and next to him, the Madagascar drongo. This is also the part of Madagascar is known for the ringtail lemur that, of course, anybody would know who'd seen the animation of Madagascar. This is the downtown section of the little town we stayed at, a place called Ifati. And we had one day where we traveled to the south to go visit some wetlands to find a group of birds that we wouldn't, of course, otherwise in the forest. It was a bit of a distance from here, so we got a ride in the zebu cart. In Madagascar, the local cattle are called zebus. It was a nice uh, means of transportation. We didn't have to walk there, but it was not the most comfortable ride. But we did get a chance to poke around the wetlands and found a nice variety of birds, including this, the Madagascar plover, mm -hmm. also kitlet plover and a few others. So that added to our bird listen experience. As the sun got warm each day, we would uh, return back, relax a little bit and rest during the heat as the birds slowed down. And in the evening, we always had a chance to have dinner and watch the sunset over the Indian Ocean. From here, we flew back to Antananarivo and then made a connection from there back to Johannesburg to begin the next leg of the journey. 
we rented a small car. This is a VW Polo. Uh, we sell the Jetta here in the United States. This is even smaller. So it was a tiny car, but we were going to be traveling for nine weeks. So we needed something that was fairly economical for such a duration. And uh, a, bird, a little car like this that is built for uh, city streets, well, we took this down some back roads and four wheeling like it was never meant to be. But uh, it, it got us there and back again. The first place we traveled to was heading to the east and south out of Johannesburg into the foothills of the Drakensberg Mountains. This is an area of grassland with a few interspersed wetlands and even among the African bird watchers has become quite a destination as of recent times. We found an amazing B&B &B and our routine was to get up in the morning just before sunrise, go out and hike for several hours, watch the birds in the early part of the day, come back for this just grand slam breakfast that held us for by far most of the day. And another treat was as we sat there, they had bird feeders out the window. Of course, these were their common birds, but first couple of days, we, these were all lifers for us as well. And in the rest of the day, we would travel around by car into the uh, hinterlands and look for birds in the open countryside. As I said, this has become quite the birding destination and these signs were now established at a lot of the restaurants and businesses indicating that they are birder friendly. So they're really trying to capitalize on the bird watching community and target them as part of their ecotourism. Just down the road from where we stayed was the Wackerstrom Wetland Reserve. And like any wetland, it really attracts a nice variety of birds. So after our morning hike, we would usually stop here first, scope out the area for a while to see what was new, any birds coming out of the thickets or something that had just flown in. And it held, of course, a nice variety of waterfowl, herons, and other water birds, and including a nice pair of crowned cranes. Mm. From here, we would travel into the uplands. And this is mostly grassland. And I guess you just follow the signs wherever those are leading to. And uh, among this open grassland was a great variety of larks and pipits. And I can tell anyone that the African larks and pipits are at least as challenging as, say, grassland sparrows are for foreigners who come to the United States. Uh, other birds that we found here were the southern bald ibis and a couple of different species of francolins. And francolins are grassland birds somewhat counterpart to our uh, quail. After several nights uh, 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 overnighting at the uh, wetland reserve, we then traveled into Swaziland. And here we spent two nights at Malalocha Reserve. This is also in the Drakensberg Mountains, but much higher up. It also is grassland with a little scattered scrub, but uh, lured a somewhat similar, but of course, slightly different variety or mix of birds. This area was originally set aside as a refuge for one of the antelopes called the Blesbach. Blesbach was nearly extinct uh, in the early part of the 20th century, and this was set up especially to recover that population. So great birding was at Malalocha, and then from there we traveled north out of Swaziland and back into South Africa, and we hit what is really one of the premier game reserves for all of Southern Africa. This is Kruger National Park. And I would say to anyone, if you're looking for a true wildlife adventure and not just bird watching, but to see a lot of the wonderful iconic mammals of Africa, this is a must see place. Now there are a couple of rules at Kruger National Park, like any place, but one of the most important is stay in your vehicle at all times, unless the area is marked. And I can tell you there are very few marked areas. So it gets a, maybe a little bit confining or cramped to tour around in your vehicle all the time, but you've got to remember that you step out of your vehicle, the animals here are not just dangerous, they will actually kill and eat you. So uh, a little bit of a trade-off for your safety. Everything is done from the vehicle, except in the campgrounds. Now, as I mentioned, Kruger is a huge national park. It is 250 miles long. It is primarily acacia scrub and grassland, but of course, across such a vast distance, there's a great variety in the habitats. And along with that brings, of course, the variety in wildlife. We had made arrangements prior because of its popularity to make sure that we could even get into these sites. We reserved our campsites and we basically camped at various uh, camps from the south all the way through the north. So we traveled the full length of the park. We spent nine days there. Now, when I say campsite and they refer to it as a camp, this is quite different than what we have here in the United States. 
they do have areas for tent camping and of course people with trailers. Then there'd be little cottages, smaller family units and much larger type of housing for different kinds of guests and price ranges. Each camp had a little different mix of accommodations, but all were very nicely set up. In addition to that, every single camp had its own gas station and mini mart. But they had to because the park is so vast, you can't possibly run to a nearby town to grab anything that you didn't forget, that you forgot about, because there is nothing nearby. And the other thing about the camps is they're all surrounded by an electrified compound fence, which is to keep the elephants, lions, and other things out. So our routine would be get up first thing in the morning, just before sunrise, we would get a little breakfast ready, and we would walk around the camp to, to do some birding there because the camps were located in some very nice forest groves. And these, of course, lured in birds that you may not find out in the open plain. Uh, about the time that the uh, fences were being opened or the gates for the camp were being opened, we'd take down the tent, pack everything up, and we'd start to head out for the day. Usually about 6.30 in the morning, they open the, uh, the gates to allow people out. And you had to be back at your next camp by six o'clock p.m. the next night. Otherwise they would close the gates, so you'd have to wait for somebody to open. So then we had all day long to tour back roads and hit the highlights and sights along the way and make our way to the next camp before sunset. Now when you're driving around here, the iconic animals of Africa are right off the road or in some cases they're right on it. And it was amazing to drive these roads and see elephants and all of these other fantastic and majestic animals right from the roadside. There were zebras, giraffes, and the Cape Buffalo. And some of these we saw in herds of over 500 of them at a time. And uh, this is another very dangerous animal. They uh, are not only in large herds, they'll run up to a thousand pounds and they've got a bad attitude. <laughs> Turns out that for a bulky animal like this, it is also the major prey item of the lions, which mm -hmm. is really quite a formidable uh, food source for them. We were lucky enough to find lion that was guarding a recent Cape Buffalo kill. And the lion is one of the most sought after of the animals in Africa for the tourists, of course. And it's what people call one of the big five. Lion, leopard, elephant, the rhinoceros, and Cape Buffalo are the five big animals that everybody wants to see. And when it comes to lions, if you're traveling a road and anybody has seen a lion, the cars will pull over and tell you about it. There's a lion down the road, we just saw one, uh, something like that. Or if you see a half a dozen cars somewhere on a roadside, you'll see that uh, there's probably a lion nearby. We actually had a wonderful experience and I haven't got time to get into the whole story, but somebody had told us about some lions and when we pulled up, they were just laying back. It was already uh, getting a little warm in mid morning and sleeping and the car was parked across that site taking photos. So we turned around and left, did some more bird watching. When we came back, we drove past a large herd of elephants and we noticed they had some young with them. And we were warned, watch for the elephants because they've been known to be aggressive enough that they will actually flip over cars and Jeeps. So they were right next to the road and very cautiously we drove past this big herd of elephants. And just beyond them, I realized, hey, here's the turnoff where those lions were. So we thought, oh, we'll go down, we'll take a look. So we drove down, of course, and these were the pictures. The lions were resting, one here and the other one behind the tree the, during the heat of the day. Got a couple of pictures and then we drove down the road a little farther. It was a dead end, just above a dry riverbed. So we parked under a large shade tree. We decided to sit back. Uh, it was approaching noon. Temperatures were near 100 degrees and we decided to have our lunch. So we sat in the car, rolled down the windows, had lunch. And just as we sat back, we heard this trumpeting of an elephant really close. It really caught our attention. And as I sat upright to see what was going on, I looked in the mirror and I saw a lion charging the car. Mm -hmm. And where people will drive for a day or two, hoping to see a lion hundreds of yards out in the savannah, he walked up to our car and within 10 feet walked right past the door. And at that point, I realized our windows were still down. So we quickly rolled him up, watched him walk right past us. And then he slowly disappeared down this ravine and all wandered off into the brush. As he disappeared, I remember sitting back in the car and telling my wife, I said, man, you just can't beat that. It doesn't get any better than to have lions walk right past the car. And I no more than said that. I kicked back into my seat and I looked in the rear view mirror and here's what I saw. 
<laughs> the entire herd of elephants was coming toward us. And now what I said, we're on a dead end road with a 30 foot drop off to a dry riverbed. And there's only one way out. And unfortunately, that's it. They had blocked the road. And mm -hmm. think, remembering that they can also be quite aggressive. We were sitting there and just waiting for them to make a move. Uh, I wasn't going to do anything. At one point, we had the matriarch walk so close to the car. I looked out the back window, and all I could see were her knees and trunk. <laughs> at which point, Connie said, "Should we put our seatbelts on?" <laughs> uh, we were really, we were really uh, concerned about uh, literally getting flipped over. And so we sat there for over 20 minutes as these elephants shuffled on three sides of our car. Eventually, they found a trail to their liking and moved out just beyond the car and, and slowly disappeared. But uh, yeah, we were in a car, but it was quite the hair-raising experience and a little nerve wracking. And quite honestly, I never took another picture after this because we had the <laughs> elephants almost on top of us. So it was not the time to you know, <laughs> focus on things and have them work with you. And here's our little car, what I call the elephant toy. Easy <laughs> for them to toss around. So that was the tent that we had in our car. And by the way, we took some camping gear with us, but I bought the tent in uh, Johannesburg, which was cheaper than trying to ship ours all the way over there. By the time we finished our Africa tour, I sold it to somebody at a high discount point uh, price. So these were some of the back roads that we drove day after day, just from one camp to the next, looking for the uh, wildlife and finding a, a nice variety of birds. And some of the many things we encountered were the gray-headed kingfisher here with a uh, lizard for lunch. And by the way, their kingfishers are more upland. They take more insects and lizards than fish. Uh, also the yellow-billed hornbill, brown snake eagle, and the main places that we also were traveling to were the water holes, as they call them. The small wetlands and ponds, which of course in such a dry environment were just magnets for mammals and birds. This is one of the larger ones that we found. And uh, we made our way then from one water hole to the next to see what we would find. And around the water holes, there were such birds as the saddle-billed stork. This is the yellow-billed stork. And in the uplands, here's ostrich shading its young under its wings and a couple others huddled under the one and only bush in the area. This is under that midday sun when temperatures are commonly upper 90s to low hundreds. After our nine nights of camping and a wonderful experience, we continued north out of Kruger and finally came to the border, northern border of South Africa with Zimbabwe. We then spent uh, the next week or so traveling the length of Zimbabwe. Our first stop was at Matobo Hills, one of their uh, World Heritage Cultural Sites. It is really set aside as a unique archaeological site, but is also known for these wonderful rock outcroppings of geology. And of course, protecting the uh, uh, green space and vegetation was another good bird watching and wildlife viewing area. This is one of the uh, rock drawings. You can just barely see an image of giraffe, and they estimate that this particular petroglyph is perhaps as much as 40,000 years old. Wow. People have been living in this part of Africa for an extremely long time, which is why they protect it as a cultural site. From here, we traveled north to a place called Hwangi Reserve, and Hwangi is their large game park or reserve and kind of a counterpart to Kruger National Park in South Africa. Uh, this is another place with those iconic African animals and a nice mix of birds. It's a beautiful site. We had two nights here. We were planning on spending much more time here, but Zimbabwe was going through an economic collapse while we were there. The entire economy was in complete turmoil under their president, Mugabe, who basically uh, stole everything from the country. And because of their problems, their ATMs did not work. They would not, we couldn't get any cash. And also, the credit card machines weren't working. So we basically ran out of money. Okay. We had no more money to spend uh, on camping. And we also were worried about the fuel we had in the car. So we changed our plans, abandoned here earlier than we expected, and then drove north. Our next destination was Victoria Falls. We figured as the premier tourist site for the country, you've got to have somebody who can get a, take a charge card or an ATM machine that might work. And it turned out we found one single ATM machine that actually worked once only. And the place we stayed at, they were willing to take a charge card. So we just told them to hold the bill and rang up all of our lodging, food, and everything else for one final payment there. Victoria Falls is considered to be one of the great waterfalls of the earth. 
uh, and it is an incredible sight. You see this great crack in the earth where the water spills over across a distance of about a mile. It, uh, you see down below how it compares with other waterfalls. It does not have the volume of water of Niagara Falls, and it's not as broad across in such a width as, say, Iguazu in South America, but it's certainly the uh, steepest of the large waterfalls at 350 feet. And by the way, my wife and I, we've seen two of the three big waterfalls of the world mm. here at Victoria, and we're lucky enough in South America to see Iguazu. We've not yet made it to Niagara, believe it or not. <laughs> It's really quite a, a, an amazing sight. And we were there in the dry season, which means that there's not the volume of water coming over and it's not a complete curtain of water across the full length of the entire cliff or crevasse, but it is an astounding sight. We also were told that when it's in full flow, there is so much water pouring over it. The mist is so thick, you can't even see near the bottom, but no matter when you go, it is truly an amazing sight. It is really quite a spectacle. There was also a nice series of trails around the waterfall, which gave us good access to not only view the falls themselves, but also some excellent birding. The one thing that astounded me is right here, you were standing at the edge of a 350 foot cliff and notice there is no fence. There is nothing to hold people back. There is simply a sign that says caution, <laughs> 350 foot cliff. And unlike say the United States, uh, you know, people fall off cliffs and then the family wants to sue the National Park Service for putting the cliff there. Here, you fall off it and it's too bad, it's your tough luck. We told you there was a cliff. So the country has a whole different approach to your safety. It's your responsibility and that's it. But uh, it was a, a little different than what I'm used to for national parks, certainly here in this country. Oh, Dr. Livingston, I presume. He's of course renowned as the first Westerner to see uh, Victoria Falls. And here's a statue dedicated to his explorations and his journey in the 1800s. Among the many birds that we found here included the purple roller. Here he's uh, taking large locusts that he's turning to uh, ingest for lunch. Also the white-browed robin chat, which is a unique family for Africa because they're neither robins nor chats. <laughs> And for an evening, we had finished up the day with a wonderful cruise on the Zambezi River above the waterfalls. And that was a nice relaxing way to take in a little bit of the scenery. We found African skimmers and a very small Nile crocodile resting here in the sun at the end of the day. So that was a nice way to wind up a, a visit to uh, Victoria Falls. Now, as I said, we were running out of money. We uh, were able to at least get a little bit to prolong our visit at Victoria Falls and then again, we were stuck. So we left the country early and it was a short travel to the west to cross the border to Botswana. And our next destination was one of their large national parks called Chobe Reserve. Now Botswana is a little different in how they approach their ecotourism. They've got some really nice developments and in some places almost five-star accommodations for people out in the jungle. So it gets to be a little more pricey and we decided to camp and save our money to pay for the guided tours rather than just on accommodation. So we set up our tent, which was uh, cheaper obviously, but it was not always that comfortable, especially when you try to sleep after a day of temperatures at 103. But we did take in two nice tours. One of them was a Jeep Safari. Now these Jeep Safaris are kind of a general tour for the casual tourist which means they're really after views of the big game animals. So it was a little unfortunate because we drove by a couple of nice flocks of birds that we didn't have a chance to view. But the trade-off of course was the bonus for us was we also got the best view ever of a leopard. Wow. So that was really worthwhile experience right there. We saw some other nice uh, species of uh, antelope that we didn't see anywhere else. The following day we had a boat tour beginning of just before sunrise and Surprisingly, the tourists didn't even begin till later in the morning after breakfast. We had this whole boat to ourselves and we had an incredible guide for this. His name is Joy. And I've been on boat tours where people will take you out on these rivers and backwaters. And if there's an animal or bird, they'll just barely slow down a bit and drift by. And you're trying to quick get a view and snap a picture before you move on. Or sometimes they approach too quickly and they chase them away. This guy was a pro in all senses. He was a guide that uh, not only had taken out a lot of birders, but even professional wildlife photographers. And he knew how to take that boat and maneuver up very slowly and approach these animals, give you just a straight on view 
wait for you to take your pictures, identify them, get a close look, and then slowly maneuver back without disturbing them. Uh, it was really amazing to be with him. And where a lot of these guides are mostly focused on big game animals, he knew the birds. He knew everyone, and we had an incredible list for the morning. Among the birds that we found here, these are marabou storks picking the last of this uh, Cape Buffalo carcass. We got a nice views of African squim skimmers as they floated by, the African open-billed stork, and also African black rail. On top of that, we also found a variety of other animals, including the biggest crocodile we have ever seen. This guy was pushing one ton in weight. He was almost 16 feet in length. And I knew this was a rare sight because even the guide pulled out his camera and started taking pictures. But this is still not the most dangerous animal in Africa. That title belongs to the hippo. More people are killed by hippos than any other wildlife in Africa. We had a great experience at Chobe, and then from here we started heading south across the grasslands and into a very dry grassland flats in the southern part of the country. We ended up at a place called the Nada Sanctuary, and this is all dry, uh, semi-desert grassland. We drove into the reserve ourselves one day, did some great birding, found a nice variety of things on our own, and the next day went out with their local guide, who was also quite the bird expert, and showed us things that we had missed the previous day. In the grasslands, again, there was a nice variety of larks and pipits, and we found the black kurhan, which is a member of the bustard family. And uh, its relative, the cory bustard, here we see male in full display, he was out there. As we traveled down the road a little further, we came to a vast lake where we found flamingos and here the African great white pelicans. This lake is a very unusual ecosystem the waters originate in Angola, way over toward the Atlantic Ocean, and it takes three months after their rainy season for the waters to flow down the Okavango River all the way to here. The river never meets the, the ocean. It flows into this flat open pan, and after the rainy season, it may form a lake 100 to 150 miles across, stretching throughout this whole area, and then the rain stop. And under the hot African sun, it slowly begins to evaporate, and in most years, the lake will disappear entirely. The birds will move somewhere else, and then the lungfish and the uh, frogs will burrow themselves into the mud and sit out the season until the rains come again. So a truly unusual ecosystem. From here, we headed around, uh, followed the river north, and then we came to the Okavango Delta, where the river comes through. We had some more camping here and found another guide to take us up the river, and we spotted some other wonderful birds, including the African jacana, African darter, which is a relative to our Anhinga, and also the little bitter, who is basically the counterpart to our least bitter. We continued further north and had another river cruise, and uh, here we had a guide who took us farther up the river to a very unusual nesting colony. If you look along the river bank, you see all these little holes and perforations. Looks a little bit like our bank swallow colony, but these are not nesting colony of swallows at all. These are carmine bee eaters. Now, bee eaters is a huge family of birds that are represented very well across Africa, also some into Asia, even Australia, and one in Europe. The carmine has a spectacular deep red color, and uh, we watch the birds coming back and forth, snapping the large insects out of the air. Uh, they have moved through just like little rockets. They are really quite the acrobats. So that was a nice treat for us. I uh, stopped to get a haircut along the way, some of the unusual things you see on the road. And we then continued farther west and entered into Namibia. Now, in Namibia, we had hoped to go to Etosha National Park, but looking at our itinerary, it was a bit of a drive out of our way, and we didn't find justice in just trying to spend a half a day there. But as I said earlier, we left Zimbabwe early, ahead of our schedule, so we were able to take in Etosha, which was really a nice opportunity for us. Etosha National Park is another one of South Africa's, uh, or Southern Africa's great game reserves. It is uh, essentially Namibia's counterpart to uh, uh, Kruger National Park. And by the way, if you ever watch any of the uh, African game specials that are on say the Nature and other PBS shows, you may notice that at the credits, a lot of these are shot at either Etosha or Kruger because the animals are just so easy to find there. 
Etosha is even drier than Kruger, and we are now in the dry season. So these water holes drew everything in. This first water hole we visited had 17 giraffes around it, along with the kudu, the large antelope you see. There were jackals there and a variety of other mammals, and of course, a nice mix of birds. And so here we drove past some of the little uh, scrub and forested areas, but really made our destination from one water hole to the next. And every water hole had this concentration of mammals and birds. And each of these were just an incredible mix, like a menagerie. Here we're seeing springbok, elephant in the background, oryx and ostriches. Here we have early in the morning, the impalas are coming down to drink before they go out to graze on the uplands. Springbok here loading up before they head out for the day. And after they fed, they look for some of the sparse shade out there to get away from the hot African sun in midday. It was also at Etosha we came across the biggest pride of lions that we found in the entire trip. And this was over a dozen of them. They were very well fed. They had just made a kill that night. And you could tell by their swollen bellies, they were well fed that night. And uh, there were some big lions among that pride, especially this one. After three nights of camping at Etosha, we started a long drive to head to the Atlantic coast. And uh, we were not able to make this all in one day. So as we traveled along, Connie started reading about some possible destinations along the way. And it was just by chance we found Spitzkopf Park. And it was really quite a treat for us. It was not on our map. In fact, we had never even heard of it in our research. And we found this incredible campsite that was just totally isolated from everyone. We were lucky that night, we had a full moon. And when the sun went down, this uh, sandstone began to glow in just the deepest red colors. It was really quite a magical place. Great. So this was really quite a nice surprise for us. From here, we continued the next day to make our way toward the Atlantic Ocean. We crossed over the edge of the Kalahari Desert and then went right straight through the Namib Desert. The Namib Desert is basically the Western extension of the Kalahari, but it is considered a separate desert because it is so much drier than the rest of the Kalahari. Some of it is so sparse in plant life. It looks like a sandbox. There's hardly anything growing for acres and acres. A uh, very, very uh, drought-stricken area. But yet it is home to some very unusual plant life, including this one called the Wellwichia. Wellwichia is an endemic plant found nowhere on Earth except in the Namib Desert. Notice the ring of rocks around it. This is to keep everybody out. You're not allowed to walk in that circle to protect the plant because this single plant is over 2,000 years old. Wow. Most of their life, they spent in total dormancy waiting for the sparse rains to come when they shoot up, put on a little bit of growth and may even flower, which only may also occur once in a decade at the most. And the Namib Desert actually comes right up to the Atlantic Ocean. And then there's this tiny narrow strip of green because of a little bit of moisture there. And they've made some nice little settlements, two towns called uh, Swapkamund, and then down the road is another one, Welvis Bay. These have actually become also quite the birding destinations. We found quite a bit of information of some fantastic birding to be had at Swapkamund. So we have traveled around here, mostly looking at the tidal flats. Here's a large concentration of avocets in the foreground with flamingos in the back. And among the flamingos, we had a lot of lesser flamingos and even a couple of graders mixed in with the flock. There also were a variety of shorebirds, uh, a very uh, re range restricted turn that we found here and uh, a nice mix of uh, other water birds in these tidal flats. From the coast, we headed inland toward the capital city of Namibia, that's Windhoek. Now, there's a recently built highway. It only takes about three hours from the coast straight to the, uh, the capital, but we decided to take the more scenic route we had all day to travel, and we took this little road. And uh, instead of three hours, it took us almost nine. I didn't realize it was quite such a tough road, especially for our little car. There's a whole story behind that, but uh, we were lucky we didn't have a car trouble at all because we hardly saw a single car in all nine hours on this back road, but it certainly was the scenic route. When we arrived in Windhoek, we spent two nights staying with this couple. This is Heinz and Janine Krimery. Uh, Heinz is a native of Germany, and by the way, Namibia was a German colony. Uh, Janine's family is of German descent, but she uh, grew up in Namibia, and then they married. Uh, Heinz is very active with the German society, and especially one of their uh, large social clubs, which is found around the world with uh, German people, called the Rhine Club. 
or more uh, precisely, Rheinische Freien. Um, my parents came from Germany, and they were very active in Milwaukee's Rheinische Freien. And so when Heinz and Janine came to uh, the United States, they actually stopped in Milwaukee, met my parents, which is how we made contact. So they had their uh, contact information. I emailed them, and they were very welcome. They said, yes, if you make it the wind hook, please stay with us. They were wonderful hosts. They gave us a chance to rest, relax, do some laundry, get our feet on the ground, fix a flat tire. And on top of that, they helped us to go over our map and some of the sites we wanted to see and help us to uh, tighten up our itinerary for the trip from here all the way down to Cape Town. As we headed out, we spent a lot of time on the back roads. And uh, here we headed to a number of different sites and eventually made our way to Fish Creek Canyon. This turns out to be the second largest canyon in the world behind the Grand Canyon, of course. It was formed through erosion in the exact same way over tens of thousands of years. And uh, it is the exact same kind of geological history as Grand Canyon. It just doesn't have quite the uh, colorful layers of rocks that you see there. So this was a unique site to take in. As we headed out of here, we stayed on the back roads. And I do mean back roads. So these are some pretty desolate trips. But we both really enjoyed Namibia for its wide open, almost desolate type of uh, expanses. It was a very unexplored area and really a true wilderness. As we continued south, we crossed the border from Namibia back into South Africa and we're heading toward Cape Town. And from there, we made our way over to the coast. We visited a place called West Coast Park and a very windy, rough surf with waves crashing, lots of birds flying around. And we were treated to the sight of humpback whale here breaching right off the coast in front of us. We headed a little further down the coast and we stopped at a gannet colony. These are Cape gannets and this nesting colony is home to 17,000 breeding pairs. Wow. And to be able to really support that many birds and all their young, it gives you some idea of the richness of the ocean with its upwellings feeding these incredible schools of fish that of course feed not just the, uh, the birds but all the other sea life. So here's our Cape gannet coming in. We continued south to Cape Town and just outside of the city is Table Mountain and is a nice little breeding colony of penguins there. These are called the jackass penguin or then it's it got its name by the way because of its uh, call which is sort of a brain like a donkey. The Af uh, African people considered to be a somewhat uncomplimentary name and since it only breeds in southern Africa they prefer the name African penguin. They're a nice large colony of birds, some in breeding uh, plumage, here are some in uh, non-breeding plumage. And uh, of course, you just can never get too much of penguins. In fact, one afternoon, I think I shot 350 or 400 pictures of penguins. But I mean, these are all I'm gonna show you. <laughs> just down the way is, uh, this is Table Mountain Park. And the point that you see off in the distance, that's the Cape of Good Hope, the Southern tip here of uh, Africa. This is all protected as a national park and uh, it's just a spectacular area for its scenery, its bird life, and its plant life. This is called the Veld uh, ecosystem. And the Veld is very unique for its plant life. It is home to eight and a half thousand species of plants and more than 80% of those are found nowhere else in the world. Very unique to this corner of Africa. And of course, with the unique plant life, it also hosts a whole variety of unique animals including a nice variety of the sunbirds. Here, this is the uh, double collared sunbird. Sunbirds to us look a lot like hummingbirds. They act like hummingbirds, they're pollinators. They've got different shaped beaks for the different kinds of flowers that they take advantage of. Uh, so in almost every respect, they look like a hummingbird. They, they act like a hummingbird. They're very much adapted, but they're totally unrelated. These are ecological counterparts. They have a completely different origin in the bird world. And the main difference is that they can't hover. So they fly and crawl from flower to flower. But basically the hummingbird counterpart of Africa. Now, when you're hiking the back country, watch where you go. There's always a chance for some of the big snakes. This is the puff adder, one of the many venomous snakes. We actually saw three of these along the way. But uh, keep your distance, they'll leave you alone. And obviously we left them alone. Down the way a little bit, there was an abandoned quarry that we had read about. It's a very special place to stop for birding because it was a home to a nesting pair of Varroa's eagles. And we were lucky that we had both the adults there soaring around this site. They were not using the nest that year, it was not active, 
but we also met a person who had been monitoring those particular nesting, uh, the nesting site right there for 27 years. And he told us everything about the history of these eagle pairs. And uh, he took us up where we could see them right across the top of the, the cliff soaring right in front of us, time and again, giving us incredible opportunities for some photography and just to enjoy these majestic birds. As you travel up the southern coast of South Africa from Cape Town or going to the east, this is called the Garden Route. And the Garden Route is an area of incredible scenery with mountains coming right down to the coast, lush forests and just a spectacular scenic area. And there is one national park next to another wildlife reserve next to another protected area. And quite honestly, while we spent a good week traveling along this stretch, we wish we would have had another two weeks to explore it even more thoroughly. And I'd recommend for anybody, if you're looking for a great road trip, the garden route is just a spectacular trip and uh, easy to do by car. You just have to keep in mind, they drive on the other side of the road. <laughs> we continued down all the way to the city of Port Elizabeth before we headed uh, inland going north again. And here we made arrangements for an ocean cruise and we went out looking for birds. Unfortunately, this was coming into our late fall, which means for Africa, that's their spring. And with the coming of spring, a lot of the seabirds had now begun to move south toward Antarctica. So we didn't pick up much for pelagic birds, but we were treated to the southern right whale and its calf. So that was a bit of compensation for it. We had four days to get back to Johannesburg, so we stopped at the Addo Elephant Park and Reserve. We went to Mountain Zebra Park a couple of places, and we hiked the trails here and there along the way, taking our time to get back to our beginning point. Uh, at the uh, uh, Addo Elephant Reserve, kind of an unusual sign here. You got to watch out for not just elephants and big game, but even the dung beetles. They've got the right of way, so they're trying to protect all the while, and we found that to be unique. We finally got back to Johannesburg, and this is the very B&B &B right by the airport that we stopped at when we first entered. So uh, here we had a chance to regroup. We took all of our equipment. We made three different piles. Uh, one of, of everything that we had with us that we're going to take for the next journey, uh, another pile of things that we were going to sell or give away, and then others that we could fit into an extra suitcase we brought with us, and we we're going to ship that home. So we weren't going to need our camping gear anymore, all of our books, maps, a few souvenirs, and things like that. We uh, put that in a suitcase and shipped that home. Uh, it cost us actually quite an awful lot of money for just one suitcase to ship it, but it was right at our front door when we arrived home months later. And uh, these were things that we uh, were probably worth more to us that we could never replace or buy again for the same price. And as I say, the rest of it, I sold my tent, sold a cooler, and we just gave the rest of the stuff away to the people at the hotel before we departed. From here, we flew out of Johannesburg. We made our way up to Dubai and then over to Mumbai. Uh, it was a stopover in the Middle East for one night and then into India. When we arrived in India, this also was a British colony, just as South Africa. But South Africa to us had a real European flavor. It was very comfortable, very easy going and somewhat familiar. India, the British were there, but this was such an old you know, ancient culture, they had very little impact and it really was almost a culture shock. It was really quite a different world. And it was really a, a nice, a complete change and surprise to us from our experience in Africa. From Mumbai, we flew straight down the coast to the little state of Goa to be right along the, uh, the coast of the Indian Ocean and beach. And uh, right here at Goa, this has become quite the tourist destination. A lot of people come here uh, traveling from around India, a lot of international tourists. The greatest number of international tourists come from Russia. And every restaurant and hotel had signs in three different languages, Hindi, English, and Russian. So of course, most of the people come here for the beach scene. We were there as a uh, jumping off point for the birding. And we were really lucky while this is getting to be known as a birding site, there were very few birding guides listed. In fact, the only one we heard of was the fellow in the back that you see here. This is Sandosh. And it turned out that as we inquired, Sandosh was already hired by this couple from Sweden. But they were so nice to find another uh, a couple of birders. They said, well, yeah, definitely join us and we'll go out and uh, he'll show us around. So uh, we birded with them for several days and Sandosh uh, did an incredible job of finding birds for us. He stopped at a favorite little wetland site just crowded with water birds. A tremendous variety of ducks and other uh, water birds and uh, 
uh, some of the lap wings and uh, sandpipers. So a nice mix. And of course, as anybody knows, sandpipers can be tough to identify anywhere in the world. But in a foreign place like this, it's nice to have an expert to help you weed them out and sort them out real quickly. He also made arrangements for a river trip. So we drove south to the Suara River. And from here, we had a whole half, an entire half day tour and even brought along his old mentor and professor. So we had two expert guides to help us. This was a very rich area for birds. And in just a single morning, we had six species of kingfishers right here, among everything else. Best picture I got was from the most common of the kingfishers, rightfully called common kingfisher. From here, we headed inland and we headed uh, further into a forested area into the Ghat Mountains. Now, when you look at a map of India where it comes to the south toward a point, there are two mountain ranges running down each side of that southern tip of India called the Eastern and Western Ghat Mountains. And the Western Ghats are known among the bird watchers and ornithologists an area of real high endemicism, a whole uh, concentration of birds found nowhere else in the world. And we made arrangements to stay at a place called the Backwoods Camp. Backwoods Camp was a, a place that was bought and developed by this fella and two of his friends. They're all bird watchers and birding fanatics, and they bought it as a bird watcher camp, and their clientele is bird watchers from all over the world and bird photographers. Our itinerary every morning, we'd get up in the dark, they'd have tea and coffee and some cookies, we'd snack a little bit, get everyone together, and head out and bird watch for three hours straight until we came back for a huge breakfast, relax for a few minutes, go back out and bird until the middle of the day, come back for lunch, relax, rest in the heat of the day, and then get up and go bird again for the afternoon till dark, and then sometimes even go out for a night tour looking for night jars. We birded from day till night, and it was incredibly productive. A little exhausting, but these guys worked themselves to death to find birds. Uh, one of the really unique birds that we found was roosting right back behind the camp, and uh, this is related somewhat distantly to our night hawk and whippoorwill, this is a unique group of birds called the frog mouths. They've got that huge bucket mouth for large beetles and moss that they eat. And of course they feed nocturnally. So during the day they look for the thickest shrub to hide in. And uh, boy, they were like five feet from us and you could hardly see them. And it took a little while, almost like a puzzle to see these things camouflage so well in there. So they were really nice picking out birds that again, like any good guide you wouldn't find on your own. After about a week's time here of hitting all these different sites, we came back to uh, Vasco da Gama City, boarded a plane, and flew inland to Bangalore. And at Bangalore, we did something that astounded even the Indians that we had met there. Uh, this is, we tried to get a picture of it, but you just cannot imagine the traffic on the roads in the big cities of India. It is a traffic jam, day, night, 24 hours a day. They'll, they'll be six or eight lanes wide, on the road and there'll be 20 lanes of cars and motor scooters. They are packed in there and there are no rules. It is all freestyle driving. If you back off to give more than three feet to anybody, if you give them some space, two motor scooters will slip in. The brave thing that I did, I rented a car and I drove a thousand miles in India. <laughs> our, but this gave us our freedom and a chance to get around to the places we wanted to visit that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So traveling on our own, the car was the best option. Our first destination was the uh, Muda Malai Tiger Reserve. And we found a nice little place to stop. And uh, some of the different birds we found here was the peacock, uh, male peafowl in the wild. There also were Indian elephants. I wish we would have had a little better accommodation. It looked really nice on the internet. Uh, somebody must have played around with their camera angles a little bit. This was what I guess you could call rustic. <laughs> uh, surprisingly, we also were the only guests there. <laughs> Imagine that. But the people were really nice, really friendly. This is the dining hall, dirt floor. And uh, we kind of looked at each other and hoping that, well, I hope maybe we'll at least not get sick here off the food. Turned out the food was delicious, very nice. Uh, we all, uh, we digested very well. It was very great. The guys were nice, but I guess the place could use a little bit of a facelift. <laughs> The next place we went to was really a nice compensation for that. This is called Jungle Lodge and they had private cabins and we had the one at the farthest edge of the reserve and a uh, nice little porch and deck and we sat right there. This was the view looking straight off our deck at the Ghat Mountains. We also were really lucky that most of the people that come there are just to relax and maybe to see a few of the big animals. They have a staff ornithologist and bird guide 
Uh, this is Raj Kumdar, and he knows all the locals. And uh, he was just a go-getter. He would spend all day with us and tracking down birds till we were almost exhausted. Uh, one day when he couldn't come, he put together a whole itinerary and hints for us to go birding on our own and then met up with us later on and took us out again at his convenience. Uh, as I say, he was quite the, quite the go-getter and really enthusiastic bird watchers. Uh, really nice to be with someone like him. We found, as I say, a great variety of birds, but this was a real treat. At the very end, as we were heading back, our last morning out, we had just jumped in the Jeep. We were heading back for lunch and we were going to be heading on to our next destination. A bird flashed right over the hood of our vehicle. It's brilliant. Uh, turquoise, blue and other colors and dove into the thickest bushes. This is the Indian Pitta, an extremely secretive bird. And it turns out back at Backwoods Camp, we were calling for one at sunrise at the very uh, first light of day. And we had one come in. The guy standing right next to me is just staring through his binoculars. Spectacular. Oh, he's gorgeous. I was, I was standing next to him within just a few feet going, where? What are you seeing? And all I got was the top of the head. So I was really sorry I missed the bird. And here we had him again. We were able to make up for it and added one more to our list. From the jungle lodge, we headed up the mountains and then drove down the winding road through the length of the mountains. Because it was a narrow winding road, there weren't a lot of places to pull over. But uh, we were warned about this. If you do slow down your car, and these are always nice mild temperatures, first thing you do before you hit the brakes, roll up your windows because the Reese's monkeys will be on your car and they will try to get in to grab anything they can. This is taken right out the back window of our car and you can see this guy's not only curious he's almost mischievous trying to find any way to get in he's eyeballing already something in the back seat of our car now i can't imagine what it'd be like to have a monkey in your car but i don't think it would end well <laughs> as we traveled down the uh, mountains we came into the tea country this is around munar there's several tea growing regions in india of course darjeeling is in the north is the most famous or well known but uh, this is tea plantations and it was really nice to see these big tea groves. Of course, they cut down a lot of forest, but they did reserve right behind that a large forest track as the Periyar Tiger Reserve. So a little bit of balance, I guess, here between protecting some of nature while exploiting the land for tea agriculture. Periyar Tiger Reserve and this whole southern region of India is just recently been discovered by the bird watching uh, community. And we have found only a little information about it but it holds a lot of endemics, a lot of secrets. Unfortunately for the independent birder, it was not yet well developed. And so unfortunately, I think we missed a couple of really good birds and good birding opportunities. We did get out into the reserve to hike with some of the uh, rangers and guards. Uh, so we did find a few birds, but no doubt it held an awful lot more that uh, we wish that we would have found. I uh, note, by the way, here's Connie with the leech socks that you wear in your shoes and tie up to your knees because the leeches in India, Southeast Asia, and other places of the world, uh, they're, they don't not just in the water, they come out of the soil after the rains and they love to climb up looking for a meal. We did find, as I say, a nice variety of birds, also black langur monkey. We had the wild boars, a couple of things that we were able to get pictures of. But uh, as I say, as this area develops, I think it's gonna really open up to the birding community. A lot to be found. Now on our return trip going back to Bangalore, it was a long, slow winding road through the mountains and uh, it was incredibly scenic, but uh, to race back to town, it was just gonna be way too congested or, or difficult. So we headed through the lowlands, through the rice country and eventually made our way far to the east to the main highway, which would take us back to the city. It was a two uh, day drive to get there. And uh, fortunately the signs were written in three languages on top that's Hindi, the local language, that's Tamil, and fortunately for us, at least one that we could read, there was English. Getting back to uh, Bangalore, a bit of an adventure to try to find in a city of 25 million, the rental company where we got the car. Uh, again, there's a story there, but I haven't got time for it. But we dropped off the car successfully, made our way to the hotel, and then we jumped on Spice Jet. And Old Spicy took us from here all the way up to New Delhi. From New Delhi, we made trips in a couple different directions to check out a few sites. We did most of this by train. Our first ride was going toward the west out into a grassland area. And of course, as this sign clearly indicates, this is the Tal Chapar Grassland Reserve. 
the reserve was actually set aside for the only antelope known to India. This is the black buck, a spectacular uh, antelope. But of course, the grasslands are also home to a great variety of birds as well. And we hooked up with a bird guide here who really showed us around and shared a lot of neat things with us. Some of the interesting birds included white-throated kingfisher. The people here, of course, get around in traditional fashion in this semi-desert region with camel and cart. And by the way, you can get a family of five on a motorbike. We returned then by train from Tal Chapar after a few days to uh, uh, Delhi. And then from there, we took another train heading south to the town, the city of Agra. That's, of course, uh, home to the Taj Mahal. And I don't know if you can go to India and not see the Taj Mahal. So we took this in as a, a little bit of a cultural site and tour. And we didn't plan this. We had no idea. In fact, uh, as we were going through our latter part of Africa, I think it was, uh, Connie asked, so where are we going to be for Christmas? Complete serendipity. We happened to be at the Taj Mahal on Christmas Day. So that's how we spent our Christmas. Someone took our picture, and this ended up being our e-postcard, our Christmas card that we sent back to family and friends. And, of course, a site like this, there's always going to be a lot of other visitors, but it is something that is worth seeing, and it was everything that you could imagine. We were pretty well blown away. Yeah. Back at our hotel, they'd set up for a Christmas celebration. I came in second in the mustache contest. This was our doorman. He was all decked out, and nicely that they did for the foreign guests. They dressed it all up with balloons and other things for Christmas dinner, served a special meal. But, of course, you got to remember, most of these people are Hindi. Christmas is not a celebration for them but they did it for their guests. That was very nice. From Agra, we headed west to uh, a, a city of Bharatpur. This sits right on the doorstep of the Keoladeo Wetland Reserve. And we birded here for several days and uh, the wetland offered us some really good wildlife. Uh, they've got these old dikes and roads that meander through it. And so we traveled there by bicycle rickshaw. We hired one of the local guides. We asked for somebody who knew the birds and he took us around and showed us birds. And sometimes when there were birds sitting just off to the side, we didn't have to get out of the rickshaw. He would just turn it to us, lift up your binoculars. He'd point them out, check them off, get a picture or two and then ride on and then take a hike somewhere else. So a very comfortable way to be able to do your bird watching for the day. And especially for such long roads to cover a distance by bicycle and then hike around for a while at one place and another. After that first day, we hooked up with this person as a guide, and uh, it was through arrangements of somebody else we had met previously in the trip at Backwoods Camp. They phoned this guy and hired him for us. He was top-notch guide. He was just wonderful. His name Mahat uh, Singh, and he was just uh, incredibly accommodating, very friendly, and like any of these guys, he knew his birds, and he really enjoyed sharing them with us, and it was a real treat to spend a couple of days birding with him. He took us throughout the reserve again to look for birds, took us up into the grasslands and a couple other special places. Among the birds we found here included the white-throated water hen, rose-ring parakeet, and even a roosting pair of scops owls at mm -hmm. one of the little farmyard buildings mm -hmm. that he knew about. Early one of the mornings, we had painted spur fowl, again, kind of a counterpart or relative to our grouse. And a bird I really wanted to see this is bar-headed goose, and this is a bird that's been on my list for a long time as uh, a destination bird. This is one of the highest flying birds in the world. They winter in north central India, these big wetlands, but nest in Siberia, which means twice a year they fly over the Himalayas and are commonly sighted at heights of 25 to 30,000 feet. That's as high as jet airplanes fly. So really an astounding flyer and really nice that we finally were able to see these birds up close. We also had a nice view of the Indian roller with his brilliant uh, colors. And then from there, we continued to our next destination, one more reserve, and uh, a couple of scenes at the train station, some of the locals, and of course, a cow waiting for his train. And then we stopped at the Rantham Boar Tiger Reserve. We had several days here and met up with another ornithologist and bird guide, and were able to uh, explore this area nicely. They did have a uh, Jeep safari into the reserve that was uh, actually arranged right through our hotel. Uh, again, we didn't stop for all the bird flocks. They were there just for the big animals. Uh, here, us and a couple other guests are getting out of the Jeep. It was a cold, damp morning. Uh, so you're out in the open air, but they've got these Jeeps with the seats in the back that it's like sitting in bleachers. 
So you got a complete 360 view. You can uh, bird watch and photograph right off there. So it's really a nice way to get around. So as I mentioned, they were really looking for the big game animals. We did miss a few intriguing birds, I'm sure, but we were rewarded with a real special view. We found tiger in the wild. Mm. This huge male was out there and we actually watched him for a long time as he relaxed here, got up, walked over, laid down again, moved another time, and then finally sprinted right across the trail behind us. Powerful animal and really exciting to be able to see tiger in its wild environment. That was quite a highlight. That evening we came back to our hotel and went to a local restaurant. This is up on the roof and we celebrated New Year's. So in India we had our New Year's. It was open air. It was cold damp air but there were lights on every building and we had a nice enjoyable meal and from three different places as loud as you can imagine. They were blasting some form of Indian techno rock or something. It was <laughs> Uh, it was festive, let's put it that way. It was an interesting experience. We then uh, took the train back from here to uh, Delhi and then transferred to another train to go all the way north of Delhi, uh, up into the lowlands just below the uh, Himalayas. Our destination this time was the Corbett Tiger Reserve, named for Jim Corbett, a uh, great tiger hunter originally, killing a number of man-eating tigers that nobody else was able to take down and eventually turning to tiger conservation and leading the way for some of these major reserves to protect the tigers. We had made arrangements when we got there to go into the reserve with a guide, and it was a 20 mile drive down dirt road to get to the camp itself, way deep in the forest. We spent two nights here at uh, the Decala camp. Again, surrounded by electrified fence to keep the animals out. And like so many other safaris, people came real short for a one day visit to see the big animals and left. We asked about a staff ornithologist and he was just thrilled to see us because that was his specialty, of course, and nobody ever asked for a bird guide. So uh, we had them all to ourselves and the same arrangement, this open air Jeep. Again, as I say, it was uh, cool in the mornings, if not cold, but it provided just the most amazing view of the wildlife. And of course, you can't get out of the Jeep because it's a tiger reserve and things here will kill and eat you. It's a nice place with this large lake and reservoir, the foothills of the Himalayas, grassland and forest. So a beautiful mix of habitats and incredibly rich in bird life. Uh, here's how you feed your elephant. They did have elephant tours. We opted not to take that. We stayed with the Jeep so we could cover more ground. We thought that was maybe a little bit of novelty and we took that in another place. But uh, they did have uh, elephants for a bit of a tour as well as Jeeps. And a nice variety of mammals, three different kinds of deer, including here the spotted deer, the uh, uh, buck and doe. And one of my favorite birds, the best of all the shrikes, this is long-tailed shrike, just a beautiful plumage, very spectacular, colorful bird. We then headed a little bit further north to a place called Pangut. And this has just recently been uh, found by the bird watchers as a real hot spot. On our way there, it afforded the very first view of the Himalaya mountains that were just freshly snow capped. And that alone was a spectacular sight and nice to actually see the Himalaya mountains. This is sitting in the middle elevation of the forest zone in these foothills. And for Northern India is another area of extreme endemicism. A vast number of the birds found here are found nowhere else in the world. So this has become a huge destination for bird watchers and bird photographers. And the lodge we stayed at, that's almost exclusively their client, uh, clientele, are birders and bird photographers from all over the world that are just beginning to discover this as a hotspot. We linked up with an expert guide again, another treat to be with another person who really knew the local birds and showed us so many wonderful things, including a nice variety of the laughing thrushes, a very big family of Indian and Asian birds. This is streaked laughing thrush. Also a member, a close relative to our chickadee, you can probably see, this is coal tit. And uh, just some great birding with a uh, backdrop of the Himalaya mountains and here enjoying the view at the end of the day. We then returned to Delhi and made a plane connection to head straight to the west to Kathmandu. So we flew out of uh, Delhi and uh, came into Kathmandu. And uh, here we had a few days. We did not have chance to plan all of this trip. So we waited till we got there to arrange our trek. 
and uh, also stayed with a family at a B&B. &B. They took us for a nice tour of downtown in the old city. We were able to buy some heavy clothes for hiking in the mountains and to be able to see some of the local scenes. We uh, toured the Imperial Palace and we were lucky. We were here just a month before that devastating earthquake hit Kathmandu and severely damaged this thousand year old uh, Imperial Palace. And this site uh, had been damaged in an earthquake in 1935. And as I was told right after we left, this had been leveled. This is more than a thousand years old and they lost this cultural icon, one of the other temples. We had made arrangements in advance to visit the Chitwan Wildlife Refuge, and that's in the south. And uh, we got there by bus ride. So the uh, family we stayed with, they got the bus tickets for us, took us to the bus station and uh, put us on this bus. Unfortunately, we were the last ones on the bus. We had the seats in the very back. And I can only describe it as the bus ride from hell. Seven hours of the worst bus ride you can imagine being bounced around side to side, up and down, back and forth. Uh, I was so bus sick, so to speak, by the time we got there, I had to take a long nap just to get my scrambled head back together again. But it got us there and back again. We stayed at a very nice little place and every morning we had to take this dugout canoe across the river to get into the national park itself. So uh, we had a guide waiting there for us to take us across. And from there we met our bird guide. We again found a top-notch bird guide. I think there's only three known bird guides at all in Nepal. And we had one of the best known there. And uh, he made arrangements with again, open air Jeep tour for us. His name, Tika Nangiri. And again, somebody who's just so enthusiastic to show someone like us uh, all the local birds and uh, take us to really some of the very special places he knew of. We found the lesser gray-headed uh, fish eagle. We had the uh, lesser whistling ducks, large flocks of those, and a whole host of other birds. And then for one day when he was busy, he made arrangements for us to take a canoe ride down the river. We traveled by canoe, dugout canoe, for about three and a half hours floating with the current. And then we spent the rest of the day walking back along the forest on our way up. The uh, important part here was that we were compelled to have to have a guide with us. You cannot walk in these forests on your own. And it's not so much that you're gonna get lost because you just follow the trails along the river. Uh, and so it can easily get, uh, find your way back again. But you see, that's a fresh tiger track right there. And that's my foot in front of it. So these are the two footprints of a tiger that had been there just a short distance before. So you need somebody who knows their way around these animals and what precautions to take. He also made arrangements for our elephant ride. And uh, this was not only a novelty, but it was one of the best ways to see some very special animals. So uh, we had a half a day elephant ride into the reserve and being up on the second story, it gave us a great view of things from up there. It was a little bit of a bouncy ride, but uh, it, it really provided or afforded for us a very spectacular view of things because you see this reserve is set aside for the Asian one-horned rhinoceros. This is one of the last strong stands of this rhino. It's a completely different species from what you find in Africa. It's one-horned and a little bit smaller. They can be incredibly aggressive if you were to spook them out in the brush and they also can be quite shy. So being up on the elephant, you can actually just approach them. You can walk right up on them. And where most people normally don't even see any rhinos, we had eight of them that day, including two females with young. So this is the only way to be able to see these animals. So it was more than just a novelty elephant ride, which of course it was that in itself. And a little bit of a silhouette of us on our elephant, making our way back toward the later part of the day. We returned back to Kathmandu and then we arranged for a week long hike in the Himalayas to do a trek in the mountains. They got a guide for us, a porter who carried the sleeping bags and other uh, gear for us. And we had our camera gear and day pack to hike for the day following along with the guide. And we had to stay to the lower elevations because this was our winter time. And a lot of the high elevations were all snowed in and the trails were closed. So we followed what's called the Lang Tang Trail. And uh, it was quite a strenuous hike in these steep slopes, but uh, we bird watched along the way. The guide was actually uh, not a bird watcher himself, and he enjoyed the fact that we were so into exploring for the birds, and we walked a lot more leisurely than most people. So he found this a very uh, leisurely and, and uh, relaxing for himself, and he got into bird watching. He ended up uh, watching with us and learning the birds, and uh, we ended up giving our bird guide to him. 
So he got hooked on that. So that was kind of a give and take for both of us. So as you can see, as you get a little higher up into the Langtang Valley, the higher elevations were all snowed in, but we hiked for about a week here, getting up to about 10,000 feet, which of course for the Himalayas is pretty low elevation. We hiked from one, what they call a tea house to the next. And these are these little places that were set aside for places, people to stay overnight or to rest for a lunch, have a little tea and get some soup. So these were set up originally for the porters and the little villages that are found along here, they are supplied with everything by porters. It's carried on the backs of these young men and uh, they will cover the distance from the, the town at the uh, end of the road up to this uh, little village of Langtang a distance of 25 miles at 8,000 foot climb. And they will do that in one day, hauling here, as you can see, a uh, bunch of food on top and a whole bunch of chairs for, uh, to a, a furnished place. We saw people carrying plywood and rebar. Uh, you can't imagine what these guys are doing and half of them are doing it in flip flops. We came back then after our trek to Kathmandu, we boarded a plane and then we're flying on to our next destination at uh, Thailand to Bangkok. And here we realize to sit on the left side of the plane as you're flying out, because you see the plane follows right along the Himalaya mountains. And for 45 minutes going out of uh, New Delhi, we had the uh, whole Himalayan range right straight out the window. We had a straight on view. And by the way, you look back this highest peak. Yes, that is Everest. We had a, a front row seats. So that was really a nice treat just for the flight itself. We landed in Bangkok and uh, we made these arrangements well in advance. Here's where we met a friend of ours. And uh, our friend John, he actually brought uh, not only his own gear with him, but all of the books and maps that I needed for the remainder of the trip. So I didn't have to lug them all this way. And then uh, by the time we were done, we loaded everything into a suitcase that we purchased and uh, everything that we no longer needed, all of our old books, maps and souvenirs, he took them back for us. So that was nice. We shared a trip with him and also had a free transportation of our, our supplies and goods. We made a little visit just north of Bangkok to the uh, old capital at uh, Ayutthaya and toured this cultural site. And it turned out to be a huge park with some great bird watching. And then from there, we uh, came back, rented a car from the airport, and we headed north to our first destination at Khao Yai National Park. A very accessible par uh, park, uh, just a few hours out of Bangkok. And of course, a very rich area in wildlife. Some of the different things we found was pied starling. Here you see a, a reflection of a swallow flying by in the back. There'd be red rump swallows, the Asian open-billed stork, and even some of the curious monkeys that were coming up the big from people. Our next destination, we headed south along the peninsula of Thailand, and we went to Kan Krechen National Park, a little drier site in a different forest type with a whole different mix of birds. They had a nice bird feeder. And of course, their bird feeders, they don't put out the niger seed or sunflowers. They just take old bananas and put them out. And it brings in birds such as the Asian uh, pied hornbill. So here, the, that was one of their backyard birds. I think we all enjoy our cardinals in winter, but that's not a bad bird to have at your feeder. Out in the forest, we found another hornbill. This is the great hornbill, the largest of them, and lots of other uh, songbirds and others out there. And one of our favorite monkeys, this is the dusky langur. They also made arrangements to uh, spend half a day in a blind. And they said this was located at one of their water holes. And when I heard water hole, I thought of Africa, a nice, good sized pond or small lake. And this is a dry area. This was their dry season. So water is, of course, an attractant. But their so-called water hole was little more than a bird bath. I was really quite surprised how tiny it was but it brought in just all kinds of things out of the bush, uh, not just birds, but also mammals, including this one that you're seeing. This is the smallest deer in the world. And something I'd never even heard of before, this is called chevrotain. And uh, this curious little animal came out along with other birds, including both the lesser, and this is the greater necklace laughing thrush. And one of our favorites, this is green magpie, very colorful bird. We then came back to Bangkok and we flew to the north to Chiang Mai and rented another vehicle and hit two more parks there. This is Doi Infanon, which is uh, at the uh, northern mountainous part of Thailand and its highest point at about 8,000 feet. 
And as you travel the mountain road going up at the very top, there's a wonderful boardwalk and trail through an elevated wetland and a very moist forest, which was a real specialty uh, as a habitat for birds. And there were things that were found here that were different from the forest uh, further down the mountains. So this is great with a mountain, you hit the different elevations and the vegetation zones change and of course, so does the wildlife. Some of the birds we found here were chestnut-tailed minla, uh, spectacular little guy. And this is one, another one of the sunbirds. This is Mrs. Gould's sunbird. And the next park we hit, uh, this is Doi Ang Khan. And this is also the home of the National Botanical Garden. So part of it is developed a little bit like a city park, but I think everybody knows that city parks just like say Whitnell Park and the Schlitz Audubon Center, deep in urban areas, but they can be incredibly rich for birds. And here we were, our friend John and Connie, watching a nesting pair of chestnut vented nuthatches. They also told us that the little building you see in the background on the right, that there was a blind back there and we're free to use that. Now, when I thought of blind, I thought like a little hut with some little peepholes in it. I was kind of surprised that's all they had. Some flower pots turned upside down and uh, just a, a cloth with a few holes cut into it. But they had a little bit of food out there. Some seed was sprinkled out as bait for them. And it brought in just an incredible variety of birds that were so easy to watch and photograph, including some very familiar looking ones. This, of course, looks like our robin, but it's its Asian counterpart. This is the black breasted thrush. And then things that look very foreign, such as this silver cheek misia. Another specialty we had here was the russet naped uh, pitta, uh, one of the other secretive ground birds. Very scenic area, a very nice mix of forests. It's also known in these dry forests for its pine forest. And one of the specialties there is the giant nuthatch, the biggest nuthatch in the world. It's eight inches long. And all I caught was the silhouette of one flying over, not enough to count it for sure. So a little frustrating, we just missed him. And I told Connie, you know, if we got to come all the way back here for that bird, it's going to get expensive. So you'll never see them all, but we did find a nice variety of things here, like everywhere. Now, our friend John departed then with uh, the things we no longer needed, took that back home for us, and then we took a bus ride into Cambodia. Our destination was the city of Siem Reap. And once we got there, we jumped on to a motorcycle rickshaw. He took us around town to our hotel. And then the hotel manager recommended what he called his favorite restaurant. So we took advantage of his recommendation and went there for lunchtime. Now, having traveled through India and Nepal and into Thailand already, we had a lot of white rice. And it was getting to be a little bland and notice the menu. Huh, yes, includes rice, includes rice. Uh, food include rice. <laughs> Surprise. But that's not the entire sign. It also reads that we never serve cat, rat, dog, monkey, or worm. Now, whether that's comforting or you wonder what the other people are serving, I don't know, but it's uh, one of the strangest restaurant signs I've ever seen. Now, Siem Reap is located at the site of Angkor Wat. And if you're going to Cambodia, this is their unique cultural site. Thousand-year-old temple uh, built by the uh, Khmer Empire and a, basically a must-see site. So we did, it was such a big site, I should say, and so spectacular, so much to take in. We did two separate tours. We started at five in the morning and went until noon till it got too hot. And we just decided it was just too much to take in in one visit. We went back again the next day. It was just overwhelming. This is just the outside of it. This is only half of one wall and all the way around, it's all carved in sandstone. Detail in every pillar, every rock, every stone, it was just dazzling, just the amount of detail that was carved in here. It was really just more than you can imagine to take in, which is, of course, as I said, we had to do two separate tours just to really believe what you were seeing. And of course, crowned by these large temples, uh, domes in the middle of it, and surrounded by a vast forest area, which surprisingly provided some incredible burning for us after having toured the entire temple grounds themselves. But Angkor Wat is not the only temple located here. There's a whole series of them all throughout here, including this uh, old gate that looks like something out of Indiana Jones movie. And then down the way, a, a much older temple with these stone faces carved in it. So these are different cultural periods. So something uh, interesting besides just the bird watching, take in some of the uh, cultural heritage sites here. We also went down to the big lake called Tonle Sap. This uh, eventually drains into the Mekong River. And during their monsoon raisins, seasons, the uh, rains 
will fill the, Mon the Mekong up so much it backs the water up and floods the lake. This is the navigation marker. We're there in the driest part of the year, but this navigation marker, notice how high the mud comes up on this. This lake will flood, and including the surrounding river, by the way, as much as 20 to 25 feet every year. It rises and falls that much. So for the people living around here, you can't build your house on stilts because in a dry season, you'd be teetering so far up, you'd be up three stories, your house would be unstable. So instead, you have an entire city that's on floats, floating uh, old uh, barrels or barges that they brought out here, and everybody lives out there. So it was a very unusual tour for us to uh, go out and uh, visit the site and uh, stopped at a floating restaurant. This is part of their gift shop. They also have a floating gas station, fire station, hotel, a uh, Hindu temple. They're all out there. So uh, I should say Buddhist temple. And uh, so really quite surprising the uh, uh, unique way that people live out there. From Angkor Wat, we flew on to uh, Vietnam and we landed in what was formerly Saigon, nor now called Ho Chi Minh City. And then from there, we jumped a bus and took a trip three hours north to the Ka Tian Biosphere Reserve, one of their premier wildlife reserves. We hiked here for four days. We rented bicycles. We got a Jeep ride with the local guide and we were able to make arrangements with uh, a couple of the bird watching guides here to really show us around and find some of the real specialties. We also walked way back in the forest to see this monster tree called the Tung tree. And uh, it was just a really spectacular ancient forest and of course some wonderful wildlife. This was our guide, his name, Tin Din. We just called him Tim. And uh, he was a young birder. He'd only been birding for about five, six years. He had really gotten hooked on it, was amazingly enthusiastic and was willing to show us everything out there and uh, would just keep us going all day long until you almost dropped and wore out. And after several days of birding with him, uh, we told him we were heading next to the Dalat Plateau, an area of Vietnam's high endemic uh, bird concentration. And he told us that he'd only been to the Dalat Plateau once to see some of the unusual birds. He was excited about it, but it was very expensive for him and somewhat distant. So uh, he would love to get back. And he made us the offer. He said, you know, if you don't mind, I could come with you. I could be your translator, your guide, get you your meals, your hotel, get your cab, take you around and be your bird guide. And all you gotta do is buy my food and pay for the room. So it was a great deal for both of us. So he accompanied us for the next several days and made that visit very easy. And we found a number of the endemic birds and he was just a joy to bird watch with. We made a hike all the way up to the top of Liang Biang Mountain, found a couple of specialties here, including the black browed barbette, and another bird, the green cochoa, a real specialty. And again, found many, many other birds with him. From here, he took the bus back to his home and then we boarded a plane and flew north to Hanoi and visited a few reserves there, including the very large Cuc Phuong National Park. This is in the rainforest and this was a very damp, rainy uh, time of the year. And so there was a little bit of mist and drizzle, but uh, we were able to find enough clear day days to get out and really hike and explore the area. And again, we asked the hotel staff if they knew about a bird watching guide. They said there was one, he lived down the road quite a distance, but they made arrangements for us for the following days to go out with him. His name is Bai. And Bai was uh, just a top notch birder like every other guide we're with. Uh, college educated, very sharp, and he kept up with all the new developments in ornithology, including a couple of recent splits two species of birds that had just been recently classified. He said they weren't even in our field guide. They had just recently renamed them based on their ecology, their songs that they recorded, their very unique habitat associations. So they're both real close relatives, but there's enough distinction that they split them into separate species. He found them all for us. So another top-notch guide that we're able to share the time with and find some great birds. From here, we headed over toward the coast to Haiphong, and as a little bit of a, a tour, we took in a, a boat ride out on the Haiphong Bay, Hailong Bay, I should say. And uh, here we got a, a boat captain who took us out and we went to these iconic uh, limestone islands out in Hailong Bay and uh, just on the edge of the Bay of uh, the Gulf of Tonkin. Local fishermen were out there. And the one thing that surprised us here was the complete lack of birds. 
there were no birds. And you would think anytime you go, even right in the city, you go down to the water, there's going to be some gulls or something flying around. Nothing. The only bird I saw was the black kite, a bird of prey. And the other bird was a songbird. And this is one of the bulbuls, the red whiskered bulbul, but it was in a cage and for sale. Uh, my feeling is they're being eaten. They're in the bird trade, the cage bird trade, and they're food for people. So uh, there's a different cultural impact here. Uh, the reserves are about the only places where the birds are and hopefully good conservation persists here that they protect those areas for their unique wildlife. Because there obviously are some real impacts with 90 million people just in Vietnam. As we headed out of uh, Hanoi, some of the unusual topiaries down the main highways. And then from there, we flew fr uh, from uh, Hanoi back to Ho Chi Minh City. And then from there, made a connection and flew onto Malaysia to Kuala Lumpur for some of the last leg of our trip. Oh, by the way, you can get a whole mini mart on a single motorbike. We rented a car here and we started driving uh, the peninsula of Malaysia to hit a couple of reserves. The first one was a small place. Uh, this is uh, right along the coast. And uh, this was an area that had a nice mix of mangrove, upland forest, and also tidal flats. So uh, Kuala Selangar was the name of this little reserve. It was tiny, but very rich in its wildlife. We stopped here, hiked in the afternoon, had a nice afternoon walk, explored the area, checked out the trails, found some good birds, and then found a place to stay nearby. And we were going to be here at the crack of dawn. We went back to the nature center and we saw that there was a locked gate right by the parking lot. So I inquired, I said, so when do you actually open the gate? He says, oh, it's always open. We just lock it here, but uh, you can come in 24 hours a day. So feel free to walk around, but just make sure you're out of the park before dark. And that struck me as a little odd. If it's open 24 hours a day, why do we have to be out before dark? He says, well, simple, because that's when the snakes come out. Uh, not only snakes, but there are also some big lizards. This was an amazing large one. This guy's over six feet long. Uh, this is related to the Komodo dragon lizard. So it's one of the monitor lizards, but totally harmless. Uh, this is the uh, water monitor lizard. Uh, rather shy and actually a little hard to get a picture because they're always running away from you. But uh, he looked like a little dinosaur. He was big. After a brief visit of a couple of days at that reserve, we drove inland to their large national park, Taman Nagara. This is more than a million acres of lowland jungle, uh, just a top-notch area and a main destination for uh, people who want to see the forest in this part of Malaysia. The surprise here was the boardwalks. They had miles and miles of boardwalk for very easy walking all throughout the park, which created great access. And of course, fantastic birding right off the trails. Among some of the specialties that we found here were two species of pittas. This is the brown hooded pitta. These are all very secretive ground birds and also blue wing pitta. Both of them were very fortunate, came out in the open for some great views and some nice photos before they disappeared again. In the evening, we stood along the edge of the park. We found a local bird guide that we could go with for uh, one part of the day. And we spent the afternoon as the sun was going down waiting for hornbills to fly in to see how many species we could see. And the shocking thing was that about every 10 to 15 minutes, these logging trucks were driving by, cutting down the original old growth forest outside of the park. And the mentality here seems to be, well, we set aside a million acres of national park, so we protected nature. Everything else is open for harvest and for sale to the international market, most of it going to China. And it sees that they're gonna keep cutting as long as somebody's buying or until they run out of forest. So at least they set something aside, but it was really disappointing to see what they were hauling out of there and the volume of this coming out, four, five, six trucks an hour. And this was original old growth forest and that's what they have. After they're done logging it, they've basically taken everything out, they burn the area and then it's planted to oil palm trees. So this is all for the uh, palm oil. These are the fruits of palm oil and it goes into so many cooking products all over the world. But I guess you really can't complain what they have done with uh, uh, their conversion to palm oil because in a sense, we did that to our forests and prairie lands too to convert most of that into cornfields. So I guess we really can't point fingers, but it's uh, really sad to see what humanity is doing to sell out some of these richest forests in the world just for cheap palm oil. 
So here's our next destination where Taman Nagar was in the lowlands. It had some nice mix of birds, I will certainly say that, and probably richer than the upper elevations, but it was hot. It was hot and steamy, and uh, you had temperatures in the upper 90s with humidity around 100%. It was hot. But uh, we went up into the uh, Bukit Fraser, or what they call Fraser Hills. This is up about 8,000 feet. This is a more high elevation rainforest. Beautiful, pleasant climate. Very nice. A little bit of a relief for us and a forest that held a complete different mix of birds. Here we found the uh, pied flycatcher, unrelated to our flycatchers totally. These are old world flycatchers. And also another unique bird. This is street spider hunter, a distant relative to the sunbirds and of course pollinators. And our last destination, we came back to uh, Kuala Lumpur, boarded Asia, uh, Air Asia uh, Airlines, and our destination was Borneo. We landed on the far northeast tip of Borneo at a city of Kol Kota uh, Kinabalu. And uh, here we made arrangements for a boat trip out to some offshore islands. We spent one day hiking island, found two uh, very unique birds out there. Uh, one Franklin and one songbird, little Premia, uh, very range restricted birds. And then from there, we rented a car and we traveled the rest of Borneo for the remaining time. Our first destination was Kinabalu Park. This is again, high elevation. And uh, this is a rich upper uh, elevation rainforest or basically cloud forest. This is the highest point in Southeast Asia uh, between the M Himalayas and all the way out to uh, uh, New Guinea. And most people come here for one single purpose, that's to hike the trails to go up to the top of the mountain at 13,000 feet. We were, of course, staying down low in the forest to explore it for its richness in its uh, wildlife. We also were lucky that the uh, staff ornithologist was available, and he hiked us with us for a couple of days to really show us around. So this was the uh, hiking trails in this incredibly rich old forest and uh, some of the real specialties. And again, a large island country like this most of the animals were endemics. Some of the specialties we found here included this tiny little thing. This is the Bornean stub tail. This guy would make a house wren seem big. Notice the leg bands, he's been captured and color marked, so he's part of a study. They knew the bird was in a territory, but even then, you got to search for this little thing. And uh, one of the tiniest birds I've ever seen outside of hummingbirds. He was tough to find in the thickets. Other good finds were Whitehead's trogon, and uh, then from here, we headed down into another lowland reserve. Again, hot, steamy jungle. And this is Sepulok Rainforest. So back into the heat. And uh, they had the best trail that I have seen in probably any national park. These massive towers that were 80 feet high with a spiral staircase. So you could look at the forest at all the upper ele uh, different elevations. And then they were connected by catwalks. And these catwalks are 40 feet above the ground. So you're suspended where a lot of the life in these jungles is in the middle and upper elevation of the forest. Instead of trying to crane your neck and look at them, they're straight out from you. So we would start out our morning watching birds and we were treated one day to have a orangutan come walking right down the catwalk toward us. So we went down in a layer or two in the elevation so we'd get a dead on view and he was coming right toward us. We were out there first thing in the morning and nobody else there to enjoy the view. We had it all to ourselves. The tourists like to sleep in apparently. A couple of especially birds was this little guy on the nest. This is a black naped monarch, one of the old world flycatchers. Uh, a special group of birds called the broadbills. This is the red and black broadbill and the black and yellow broadbill. So some real uh, unique uh, endemic birds. And another one, this is the red bearded uh, bee eater, a uh, real specialty also for Borneo. Our very last destination, we took our little rental car and we headed south to the Kinabatangan River. And here we explored by river. This was our guide and it was all done by boat because it's very lowland flooded area. And I didn't realize that Borneo had elephants. This is another species. This is the Bornean pygmy elephant, kind of an oxymoron. This is a small elephant, I guess the opposite of jumbo shrimp. Uh, another animal I really wanted to see, we saw a orangutan, so we're lucky there. And then uh, another one of the, uh, the great uh, monkeys, this is the proboscis monkey. The males, the adult males with this big schnoz on them, they are just amazingly colorful. And we watched the whole troop go through the trees be, uh, right in front of us. And one of my favorite pictures is I watched them get ready from one leap to the other. 
uh, this was a nice way to finish up our visit. We then drove back all the way to Kota Kinabalu. Uh, we spent the night there and then boarded our plane, flew back to Kuala Lumpur. We had a little bit of a layover and we finished our trip taking the uh, train and subway into downtown to relax there and see a unique site. These are the uh, Petronas Towers, which at one time were the tallest buildings in the world. And to finish up the entire trip, we were so sick and tired of white rice. We couldn't believe it on the third floor of the towers. Here's a Chili's restaurant. So we gorged ourselves at a Mexican dinner to celebrate the end of our trip. From here, we traveled then to Singapore, spent the night there and made our connection to fly all the way home. Seven and a half months later, we arrived back in Wisconsin with just endless experiences and memories. And for us, truly a trip of a lifetime. And uh, it was something never to be repeated again, but it was also one of those, as we look back, we are so glad we did it. I would hate to have dreamt of a trip like this and find myself someday unable to undertake it and feel sorry that I never did it. Uh, so this was really a trip of a lifetime and truly for us, a journey of a thousand lifers. Thanks so much for your time and patience. I'm glad that I was able to share this with you. I wish we had a chance to meet in person. I could take all the questions. Uh, we'll do what we can here. But as I say, there's so many more stories and such endless memories from it. Thank you again, everyone. You've been a wonderful audience and I appreciate you uh, spending your time virtually for this. Thanks again, bye. Thank you, Bill. And Mary. hopefully we can, everyone can unmute themselves and then if you want to, you can ask questions if you have time yet, Bill. Oh, absolutely. I've got all the time, yeah. Okay, I'm happy to do that. Let me, um, let me uh, first, just of all, say thank you to Bill. Um, on behalf of on behalf of all of us, I think uh, we're really thrilled that we could reschedule uh, Bill, um, and uh, I'm very pleased that not only he but all the rest of you uh, were willing to stand by tonight uh, after our little technical problem getting on to Zoom. another snafu like we had last month. Yeah, yeah, we'll uh, we'll see if we can prevent that from Zoom. happening. Zoom. Um, but any, anyway, I think uh, it's particularly uh, a poignant trip, uh, and as, as, as Bill says, a trip of a lifetime, um, and at a time when a lot of us wish that we were able to be traveling a little more, uh, all, all the better to uh, be able to take this uh, vicarious trip with Bill across all these continents. So anybody, any questions? Questions from anyone? Yeah, I just want to mention, if you are interested in the larger story, I, I did publish a book on this, and uh, this is available from my website. So if anybody's interested in a little bit the larger story, I'm happy to share this. Uh, it is available. Uh, $20 plus mailing, I can send it to anybody who, who might want to read the full story. And here, if you can see, if you can see it, uh, I have my copy here, and uh, I, just, I just started it. I recently uh, got this from Bill, and... Uh, uh, the photographs and the text and everything are are wonderful and and uh, as Bill says he's he's sort of he's sort of uh, uh, once over lightly tonight but there's a lot more to uh, to to read in the book so uh, well 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 worth your time uh, I have I have one question to kick things off Bill I noticed you camping in places that didn't look like they had a large electric fence. Uh, didn't, didn't that worry you and Connie a little bit? No, um, where they didn't have a big compound fence, that was because they knew that those animals were not right there and an immediate danger for you. So yeah, they wouldn't risk that. Okay. Um, but also when we were saying Kruger, these were such large camps. Uh, like I say, I describe it more as a village that you know, the, the uh, compound fence was out quite a distance around the whole thing. But okay. uh, no, we felt quite safe and we always check with the locals, you know, that's what you want to do to find out just what are the precautions. And I guess I could also say, you know, you want to go into these remote areas and you don't want to just say, you know, well, you're afraid for your life all day and all night. And you survived it and made it. What you want to do is find out what are the cautions, learn to be careful and then relax and enjoy everything. Because, you know, the locals, they don't live in fear all day and night even when they're surrounded by things that are dangerous. So uh, you learned a, a little bit of how to, to live and survive in those areas by asking those questions. Okay, okay. Weren't there lizards and insects and other such things that a fence couldn't take, uh, keep out though? Well, we 
he did talk to somebody and he said, well, it isn't so much the lizards and insects. He says, but you got to remember that uh, the cobras are not really retarded by the electric fence. They'll slip underneath. So he said, yes, even there, watch around, even around your own building, watch a little bit. And he did tell us the story that uh, one day, one of the cleaning women was uh, uh, at his cabin as he was out coming back from a little safari. And she was screaming at the top of his lungs and here right by his front door was a big cobra standing there. So uh, yeah, you've got to learn from the locals, you know, and you've got to watch a little bit. You are in the wild, definitely. Okay. Certainly are. So it looks like John might have a question. You have something you want to ask, John? <laughs> well, there are all kinds of questions, yeah. but I, I, <laughs> I could probably keep us going for half an hour. I have so many questions, but I'm just going to uh, make a comment because I, I uh, was in Vietnam also, Bill, and I had the same experience that you had. There were absolutely no birds except for in the uh, national parks and the preserves. And uh, our local guide did tell us that all the birds get eaten, including yeah. egrets and uh, birds that you would think would not be edible. They're, they're all eaten or uh, and I've got pictures of uh, some of the caged birds that were for sale. And oh, I yeah. saw more species in Vietnam in cages that were for sale for the pet trade than I saw in, in the wild. And uh, that made a big impression on me. And you just reminded me of that when you, with your comment. Actually, you know, I just read something you know, a few months ago, a uh, little uh, online summary from BirdLife International. And they say that right now in Java, there are more birds in cages than are in the wild on that okay. island. Yeah, that was So some favorite. parts of the world, cage bird, uh, the, the pet trade is huge and starting to have some very significant impacts, not just the traditional parrots and macaws, but songbirds of all kinds. Yeah. So yeah, that's, it's yeah. another worry that we have. And different cultures look at wildlife in different ways. Yeah. Barbara, I've, I've traveled in, uh, once with Barbara and once on my own in China. And uh, similarly there, struck very uh, much by how few birds were, uh, were, were apparent. Um, and uh, somebody reminded me, uh, Ma it was Mao himself who declared birds the enemies of the people uh, mm. because they eat your food. Um, and so uh, he, he campaigned to get rid of birds. Uh, wow. So you're saying he had two things wrong. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, China's not recovered from but that. But I guess it I also goes to show that, yeah, I was going to say, I think it also goes to show for conservationists working around the world, if you're working in these different countries and different cultures, your approach to protecting birds and bird habitat may be a completely different approach in those cultures than what we're used to doing in our country or in Europe. Oh, I think so. I think so, and it's a it's a it's a challenge, and and you know there is the there is the there is the case of, li of people need, needing to make a livelihood, uh, yeah. and uh, if, you know if you're if you're absolutely uh, below the poverty level and you can find some buyer for for that caged bird, uh, it may it may be the difference between whether your children eat that night, and that's pretty hard logic, I, and and that's why ecotourism is is very much the answer in some of these places so that people have yeah. a, a self-investment in, uh, in, in maintaining their wildlife. And it may be also the chance not only for them to earn money from birders like ourselves who visit there, but also to see people from a different culture have a whole different relationship with their wildlife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any more, any more questions? Um, I want to thank Bill again. I think um, Mary and I talked. Um, she's uh, nearly done compiling uh, the Christmas count, uh, and I promised her that when she sends me the final, the final tally, I will. Oh, oh. Sue, go ahead. I think it's Jackie. I'm sorry, Jackie. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I I thought I was unmuted, but I wasn't. Bill, how hard was it to determine your route? Because that was a pretty uh, long trip. Well, I hate to just push the book, but if you're really looking for the details of how we organize it, I have that in the introductory chapters. Mm. I'll share it to you briefly. The first thing I did was we first looked at places, uh, just got out the 
world map. And what we did is we pinned the world map on our wall at home for a good month or so. And I had the little colored uh, tabs that you use for like page markers in a book. And yeah. we each got our own color and we flagged all over the world map, literally all over the map, all the places that each of us wanted to go. And we had two different colors for a top destination or something nearby that you may not go to see alone, but as long as you're in the neighborhood, you might want to take that. And then we bracketed it with the dates. We were going to leave in uh, uh, early fall here and we wanted to be back before spring really got going. So we had those dates and then we started to set our uh, airline tickets for our departure and return. Then what I did is we decided uh, a route. We were first thinking, well, we could take a northern route through Europe. We'd like to see some of that, but that's heading into our fall and winter. So the birds would be leaving. So we opted for a southern route and we decided Africa. Uh, we skipped South America because that's easy to get from here. And then we certainly wanted to take in India, Southeast Asia, and I, I wanted other places too, but we ran out of time. So we had to sort of shorten that up. Once we chose the countries we wanted to go to, the next trick is just jump on the web and look at all the big birding tour companies in the world and take a look at where they go. Jump, Rock Jumper, Sunbird Tours, Field Guide, you name it. Just look at them all. And what you will do then is you'll find that as you look at these sites, well, almost all of them go to Katia National Park in Vietnam. They go to this route, they go to that place. Well, if that's where they're going, they're easy to get to. They're the first sites you should see and everybody goes there. So that's what you start to do. And then I took a calendar. I literally print out a calendar for every month and say, like, okay, we're gonna take so much time in each country. Here's when we come, here's where we go. Look at the map, what places can we see? How do we get around? And I've got enough experience from our past travel that you know, okay, we land here. It's going to take a day just to get your feet on the ground, get your rental car, get going, and a half a day to drive to here and find it. Then you want to spend enough days at a place. And there's this trade-off between staying too long where you've already seen everything and you could use that time somewhere else or leaving too early. So you got to decide a little bit. And two nights is nice, but you also have to remember, if you're only doing two nights at a place, it takes you half a day to get there. you got the afternoon and the bird. You bird all day next day, then you get up in the morning, bird, then you run to the next one. You do that too often, and you're not going to have a chance to really rest in between and relax. And what if it's raining one day? Mm -hmm. So a really spectacular place, four days. Do that so you can really explore it. You're never going to see uh, uh, all of it. So you know a little bit there, and then you've got your bracketing. If we're coming in here, we're going there, this is the time we have. And little by little, we just went through the calendar and just put that together. And I ended up with a file folder for every single place. What I printed off the web, the maps I had, the bird lists and everything else. And that was for every single country. And then I ordered up the field guides for every country. Where I could, I was looking for the books, you know, the where to go to watch birds mm -hmm. and uh, gather those resources. And then you got to figure out what you can lug with you. And like I say, we're lucky we have our friend to meet us in Thailand so that he brought all the stuff at the end of the trip. I didn't have to take books and maps that I wasn't going to use for six months, carry those with me. And then he took the rest of the stuff back home. So that, that worked out pretty well. It really, we're surprised at how well everything fell together for us. It's amazing all the work that, and how organized it seems it was. Well, we spent nine months with the logistics of this. <laughs> and the last three months, uh, every single day, trying to make advanced reservations. And here's another problem with reservations. If there's a premier national park like Kruger or a couple others, you wait to drive up to the door and you're gonna find you're out of luck and you can't stay there. Some countries will actually have lodges in the national park, but then if you can't get into that lodge, you have to camp at the nearest city, which might mean a half hour, 45 minute drive in the dark to find it and get there. And some of these parks, they may not open the front gate until eight and even nine o'clock in the morning and the birds are already slowing down. Mm -hmm. So you better have a reservation there. But then there's also the drawback with reservations. Let's say you get to a place, you realize it's a little smaller and easier to bird than you thought. And two days already, you've seen everything. Now you want to jump ahead and spend a little more time at the next site. You can't because you're locked in. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of trade-off of trying to do it on the fly, which gives you flexibility or locking in, which, yeah, it restricts you, but has some guarantee. 
Of course, the other thing is you lock yourself in, like say that what you saw in India, uh, the uh, Tiger Ranch, that little place, the dump that we had. I picked it off the <laughs> web and when I got there, I realized, you know, the web, there are only about five places to stay and half of them were full. But when I drove up, there's a half a dozen others that were, weren't even on the web were much nicer and they didn't just didn't advertise. I should have waited until I got there, but you don't know, That's should tough. you take a chance or not? I've never been there. I didn't know anybody who had been it. So you, you know, take your best guess, but you learn things once you've been there. Um, I've helped other people plan trips to some of these places. They've actually got that advantage from my experience, but uh, yeah, there's a little bit of guesswork that goes into places that you've never been to before. <laughs> But as I mentioned, if you are interested in doing a trip like this, I've got a whole series of travel tips that we've learned. I talk about how we arrange this whole trip and our whole calendar is uh, part of the uh, appendix for it. It's all right there, the total bird list and mammals and all that. So that's available in the book. And, and I'm not trying to just push book sales, but if you are interested in learning more beyond this, uh, yeah, it is available. Certainly whetted my appetite for some of those Southeast Asian destinations mm -hmm. that I have not not seriously considered before. Uh, so. Well, after all that travel, when we we're about halfway through the trip, I came up with my own motto, my own motto, which is one planet, one life, one planet, and yeah. so many birds. Yeah, yeah. That's all you got. You got one life, you got one big planet, and you got a hell of a lot of birds out there. Do what you can. <laughs> indeed, yeah. indeed. I want to, I want to remind everyone before we sign off tonight that, uh, uh, next next month on the first Tuesday in February, which is the uh, second of February, uh, we will have uh, a return engagement from Brian Lenz, uh, who is now director uh, of he has he has two titles. He's collisions campaign manager for the American Bird Conservancy, uh, and he is also the the new director of Bird Cities Americas. Um, which is uh, uh, the American Bird Conservancy and Environment for the Americas uh, have teamed up uh, to, to take the Bird City Wisconsin program uh, international uh, with, with a program that will now be spanning uh, both uh, North and South America and uh, in Latin America. Um, and uh, Brian's in the, in the process of hiring a uh, a manager for that program uh, funded by ABC uh, and Bird City, Wisconsin, which has launched uh, sister programs in eight other states, uh, will now be come under the umbrella of this uh, national international program and uh, will have a national staff to try and uh, do what we've been doing piece by piece over the last decade, uh, which is to launch Bird City programs in all 50 states. So. Anyway, Brian will be here to talk about that and, uh, and a lot of other things uh, uh, for, involved with the American Bird Conservancy, um, to which I can report that uh, uh, birds, uh, the uh, Bird Club, the uh, River Edge Bird Club, the Cutright Bird Club uh, donated $200 to uh, ABC this past year um, for our annual membership and for a special campaign they were, they were running. We, we, uh, we still sit on their original advisory committee as one of uh, one of the first bird clubs in the country to join join with ABC back. Uh, that was Noel's doing. So um, I hope you will join us uh, a month from now on the on the second of February, um, and we promise we'll be on time at uh, seven o'clock. So um, until then, and, and we'll as I start to say we'll get uh, we'll get out the report. On this, uh, on on the latest uh, Newburg River Edge Christmas bird count and all the details, um, and uh, anything anything else, Mary? Anything more you want to say? No, but uh, thank you all for your patience and sticking with us and um, chiming back in at 7:30 so we could see um, Bill's excellent presentation. And thanks to Bill again for um, for his willingness to. Um, I think this was the second time he's run into this issue with us and we do apologize for the River Edge technology problems, but. Well, I, I wanna say people wanted to see this program because I counted uh, 45 names and faces at one point and, yep. and that's yep. a full house for us. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Quite, 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 quite good. Bill, again, thank you very much. Yes, thanks. You're, you're all very You're welcome. welcome. Nice to see some familiar faces and I hope that we can see each other in person soon enough. Thanks. Me too. Yeah.
Take care. Good night, night everybody. Good night. 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 Let's see. How do you get out of here? Yep. Well.